My name is Fernando Fervenza. I am a nephrologist from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. My topic is membranous nephropathy, new insights regarding diagnosis. Idiopathic or primary membranous nephropathy is the most common cause of primary nephrotic syndrome in Caucasian adults. The U.S. incidence and prevalence is estimated to be between 3,000 and 200,000 respectively. It's not a quite benign disease in the sense that approximately 40% of the patients will eventually develop in stage renal disease. It remains the second or third cause of a primary glomerulopathy leading to end stage renal disease. But the other issue with patients with membranous nephropathy is that those who remain nephrotic are also at an increased risk for a thromboembolic and cardiovascular events. A diagnosis increases with frequency after the age of 40 years, it is much more common in males than in females in all adult groups, but is rare uh, as a primary diagnosis in children, accounting for less than 5% of total cases of nephrotic syndrome in this population. Now, as we will see later on, uh, primary or idiopathic uh, membranous nephropathy account for 75% of the cases in adults, while the other 25% of the cases are membranous nephropathy is secondary, either to lupus, hepatitis B, the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or malignancy. Patients usually present with normal or mild elevated blood pressure, and the urinary sediment is usually benign meaning that although they have, may have hematuria, the presence of red cell cast is unusual. Now, the diagnosis is made uh, by renal biopsy, which showed the characteristic thickening of the glomerular basal membrane. The immunofluorescence uh, is evaluation will show uh, staining for IgG and C3 with equal staining for kappa and lambda light chains. And, of course, the electron microscopy will show the characteristic subepithelial deposits along the glomerular basement membrane. From the clinical point of view, uh, primary and secondary membranous nephropathy are indistinguishable. One of the clues that could indicate that we are dealing with a case of a secondary membranous nephropathy is the presence of a mesangial proliferation uh, on the biopsy, or the presence on the immunofluorescence examination of C1Q, or the electron dense deposits along the mesangial, um, as well as the presence of tuberreticular inclusions on electron microscopy examination. Although none of these findings specifically uh, uh, make the diagnosis of secondary uh, a member of the property, and the clinician needs to put the uh, results of the uh, uh, renal biopsy findings together with the clinical picture uh, to really make the decision uh, if the patient is dealing, if we are dealing with a primary versus a secondary member of the property. This is especially true, for example, as to the case of the mesangial deposits, which in itself can be found in up to 30% of patients with primary idiopathic membranous nephropathy. One of the major discoveries in membranous nephropathy was the report back in 2009 by Beck and Saland of the presence of an antibody against the PLA2 receptor in approximately 70% of the patients with membranous nephropathy, while this antibody was not present in patients with secondary membranous nephropathy or other disease and was, of course, absent in normal uh, volunteers. One of the questions is that, uh, of course, the discovery of the PLA2 antibody raises that can measurement of PLA2 R antibody be useful to diagnose membranous nephropathy? And of course, has, uh, since that time, there has been a number of uh, publications, uh, all of them suggesting that, uh, in fact, the use of uh, or testing for antiphospholipase A2 receptor can uh, be useful as a, a diagnostic tool uh, 
in patients uh, uh, with membranous nephropathy. And in a recent editorial uh, in the Journal of American Society of Nephrology, Julia uh, Hostra and Jack Wetzel, in fact, uh, point out that although some additional data are needed, the available evidence suggests that it may be acceptable to start with testing for a PLA2R antibody in a patient who presents with nephrotic syndrome. Uh, with this, of course, will lead to avoidance of a, of a renal biopsy if the antibodies are present and if the patient is at a low risk of progression. Oh, we should take into consideration, however, that the uh, uh, presence or absence of uh, uh, PLA2R antibodies um, doesn't help to discriminate clinically because, um, as can be seen uh, from this study, patients who are PLA2R positive or negative present at the same uh, age, have the same sex uh, variation, at the same level of uh, renal function, is the same degree of proteinuria. Another question that uh, is frequently asked is, can the quantification of the PLA2R antibody levels predict the outcome or also help us to guide therapy or duration of therapy in a patient with membranous nephropathy? Well, the first data that we have came from uh, Julia Hostra uh, and Larry Beck and Jack Wetzel study back in 2011, where they show that patients uh, with membranous nephropathy, while they have active disease, they have very, very high levels anti-PLA2R in circulation. If the patient went into remission, then the antibody levels uh, disappear. And the reappearance with the antibody was uh, equal to uh, clear clinical re relapse of the nephrotic syndrome. Subsequent uh, studies uh, from China uh, also show that in patients with uh, membranous nephropathy, the prevalence of the antibody was very high in patients who were in active disease, but very low if the patients have achieved uh, remission. And uh, furthermore, uh, there was a correlation between the antibody levels and the likelihood of the patient achieving partial or complete remission, uh, being much likely for the patient to achieve partial or complete remission if those patients have low levels of anti-PLA2R le uh, versus patients who have uh, very high levels of the antibody circulation. Now, it was not 100% uh, 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 sure in the fact that despite very high levels of anti-PLA2R in circulation, still there was one patient that managed to achieve uh, spontaneous remission uh, in this uh, cohort. Now, another important uh, uh, observation is that not only uh, the level of the antibody uh, uh, correlates with activity of the disease, but in this study, the level of the antibody predicted a worse outcome. In other words, if patients have membranous nephropathy and they have persistent low levels of anti-PLA2R, then the, 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 uh, the risk of having a doubling of serum creatinine was very low. However, if these patients have persistently high levels of PLA2R antibody, they have a much higher risk with time of having worsening of kidney function represented by doubling of the serum creatinine. And we also evaluated the use of this antibody in patients who had been uh, uh, treated with rituximab. And at that time, it became clear that if the antibody level came down, proteinuria came down, as reflected in these two examples uh, of these two individual patients. If, on the other hand, a patient had the antibody level remain elevated, that was equal to remain with proteinuric and no remission was achieved. And finally, it was the fact that in a patient with antibody disappeared completely and went into complete remission, reappearance of the antibody equal reappearance of proteinuria. 
So this led to a group of investigators uh, uh, led by uh, Giuseppe Ramuzzi in Italy to suggest that quantifying uh, a circulating anti-PLA2R antibody uh, may be useful to not only monitor uh, activity of the disease as well as response to therapy. So what is the value of uh, staining kidney biopsies for PLA2R? Well, the first study that uh, came uh, about was uh, done uh, by Dr. Debiak and Ronco in Paris where they took uh, kidney biopsies from patients uh, who would have the diagnosis of membranous nephropathy and is stained for the presence of PLA2R. Uh, and what they found that in 21 patients who had membranous nephropathy, they found a strong positive staining in the kidney biopsy, confirming that these patients really had membranous nephropathy that was associated or secondary to the presence of the antibody. They also demonstrate that in eight patients, however, who were negative for anti-PLA2R in circulation, were also negative for PLA2R in the kidney biopsy. The interesting uh, 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 part of the study, however, was in 10 patients who have, were negative for the presence of the antibody in circulation had positive staining of the kidney uh, biopsy for PLA2R. The fact that in three patients, although they had positive anti-PLA2R in circulation, the renal biopsy was negative for the staining. The same group uh, subsequently reported that, in fact, the staining of the kidney biopsy could be used as a sensitive tool to retrospectively diagnose patients uh, who have membranous nephropathy that had been due to the presence of the antibody. In this uh, uh, slide from the article, they show that staining normal kidney uh, uh, with antibodies against uh, the protein show very faint staining of the PLA2R in the normal glomeruli while patients who have membranous nephropathy secondary to the present antibody is stained clearly uh, for the presence of the uh, protein, um, while patients who were uh, negative uh, for PLA2R in circulation didn't have uh, uh, staining on the, uh, on the biopsy. In the staining of the biopsy was negative also in patients who have membranous nephropathy that was secondary to lupus, which was an important observation in showing that lupus membranous in primary membranous nephropathy have a different pathogenesis. The interesting part also of this study is that patients who have membranous nephropathy associated with hepatitis B or membranous nephropathy associated with uh, sarcoidosis also is staining uh, uh, for PLA2R. So at least in this uh, study, you can see that although the majority of the patients that have uh, uh, primary uh, uh, membranous nephropathy is staying positive for PLA2R, uh, few patients who have secondary membranous nephropathy also had a positive staining in the kidney biopsy uh, for PLA2R. Can, therefore, we use antibody to exclude a secondary cause of membranous nephropathy? Well, this study uh, that also was done in collaboration with the group in Boston showed that, indeed, the majority of patients who have uh, primary membranous nephropathy, they have positive for the PLA2R antibody. Can we refine this by staining uh, the renal biopsy uh, in the sense that using renal biopsy staining for PLA2R can help us differentiate between primary and secondary? Well, this study by Dr. Larsen and colleagues uh, showed that uh, staining the biopsy again in, pri in patients with primary uh, uh, membrane nephropathy is strongly positive. And, but patients who have membranous nephropathy second to hepatitis B stay negative. And these investigators argue 
that yes, indeed, you could use the renal biopsy to differentiate between primary and secondary. But already you can see that there is uh, a potential issue with that information because in the previous study that I, uh, I, I show you by the group of Queen and colleagues, there was already uh, a few patients with membrane nephropathy secondary to hepatitis B. They were positive of PLA2R, while in this study they are negative. Therefore, I think that the, uh, the verdict is still unclear about if we really can use these antibodies to truly differentiate primary versus secondary. Although if I may postulate, I would say that the presence of the antibody, especially high titles in circulation, is more likely to reflect primary disease rather than uh, a secondary cause of members nephropathy. Taking all together, this observation suggests that detecting of circulating anti-PLA2R antibodies in PLA2R in biopsy samples, as well as quantification of circulating anti-PLA2R, may pro provide a tool for diagnosis and monitoring the disease activity, as well as testing for treatment efficacy in patients with membrane nephropathy. Of course, these assumptions remain to, the, to be proven, and further research is needed.